Hello, my uh, University of the East students. How are you doing today on the second week? Fine? I hope so. Uh, okay, you know, it's the second week. I already have told you the name of the school, unfortunately. I wanted you to guess. Uh, International School of the East or University of the East, which is better. You know the name of the class? Do you have any idea? What's this class about? Is this about pizza making? You know the code? History 103, Asian history. Okay. And again, this is our second week, meaning we are on July the 13th. July the 13th, 2020. We are in the summer quarter. And hopefully I have some interesting information for you, a certain part of Asian history. You'll like it overlaps with a lot of other interesting countries. And uh, it's going to be a lot of content. But uh, again, my questions are going to be long, but the answers are going to be short. So that's easy for your side. Okay, your side. My side is going to be uh, more of the writing. But you should enjoy this. This should be good. Okay. So without further ado, let me get to the uh, lecture material. Okay. Okay, now I'm gonna minimize my uh, face, put it a little higher up in the corner, I guess. Okay, in fact, I can take it away. How's that? You don't even have to bother with me. Okay. So here we go. All right. Early modern East Asia. So 16th between 18 centuries. Okay, you see the little typo here. Late Ming, 1368, 16th century. Qing, all right. So we're going to start with the late Ming consumer Culture. So we all know consumer. We're all consumers here. Um, we had consumers back then. So consumers are people who buy things. Okay. So even to suggest that East Asia had an early modern period remains somewhat controversial. And controversial means uh, people might not agree on it completely. You have your belief on it, and someone else has theirs. The word modern comes from late Latin, Latin language. And the entire concept of modernity emerged originally in the specific context of European history. There is Furthermore, no denying the driving role that was played by the West in giving shape to what we think of as the modern world. With regard to non-Western civilizations, so Asia is one, there is a natural tendency to prefer imagining them as societies that had always been changelessly traditional from some primordial beginning, uh, which means the beginning of time, until relatively recently, when the process of modernization, often understood as being synonymous or the same meaning with westernization, finally started as a direct consequence or result of contact with the modern West. East Asian history is still commonly, okay, so I'm blocking that up there a little bit, uh, divided into uh, two major parts, pre-modern and modern. So got some yellow there, you think that might help you if I ask that question. 
So again, pre-modern and modern. With the point of transition placed somewhere in the 19th century. They say somewhere because they cannot put the exact date. We don't have records for that. It happened around that time. Yet, paradoxically, the use of paper money, printing, gunpowder, urbanization, meaning the making of large cities, market-based commercialization, complex bureaucratic administration, which we call red tape or government record keeping, and a relatively fluid, meritocratic, socio, all hard words here, political order based on the examination system. Not important at all about that. But all these things made the Song Dynasty of China in 9600 to 1279, or 960 to 1279, seem curiously modern already a thousand years prior. The idea of a changelessly static East Asia, at any rate, is a fantasy, sustained only by lack of historical knowledge. So if most Western people thought, well, you know, China and Japan and all these countries were basically just the same for hundreds and hundreds of years, it's a fantasy. And the only reason that uh, Western people would think that is because they lack the uh, exact historical knowledge, right? And that happens all over the world. If long-term historical change is acknowledged for the non-Western world, another common approach has been to assume that it must naturally have followed the familiar three-stage European historical sequence of ancient time, medieval, which they talk about castles and King Arthur, that helps you, and then the modern time. This sequence is often presumed or guessed to be universal and is applied rather mechanically, for example, to East Asian history. As it happens in East Asia, the case of Japan actually does provide one of the closest parallels to this European developmental curve that can be found anywhere in world history. Between Japan's age of classical antiquity or ancient times and modern times, Japan did experience a feudal middle phase that was uncannily, which is like saying so similar, though imperfectly reminiscent or similar of the European middle. So uh, we are done with our first page, which would be if uh, uh, she has the book would be 160. She loves to buy the book. Uh, so I have to go to the whiteboard and write my long questions where you, my lovely students, are going to supply um, short answers, mostly. They know what I got to do. I got to get that pencil before Bernie or Tim Wichit steal my pencil. Because you know they will. Tim Wichit will probably steal it and then give it as a gift to Tom. Okay. So. I've marked down the page. Let me get on to the first question. If you paid attention, you can probably answer these in your sleep. Okay, question one, how many parts is Asian history divided into? Is it like Chinese have an affinity for the number 108? So maybe Asian history is divided into 108. Who knows? You think I know? No, that's not possible. 
Okay, two. So this is kind of connected to one. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Two, the point of transition was when? So this is connected to one. Once you have the answer to one, uh, when was the transition done? It's about, it's like a guesstimate, so I'm not asking for a exact date, okay? You remember the reading. It's set up perfectly for you to answer. Okay. The last one for this page. Oops. Gotta love those capitals. See how long my questions are, but you get a short answer. You only have to supply me the country. Okay, so my last question for this first page, which Asian country, and it specifically states in the reading, experienced the European three-stage history sequence? So I'll give you a few minutes to answer those or at least write them down. Right. And that means you, Pamela, Python, you tend to forget things. You send me things and there's no answer. So make sure you write those things down. Let me mark off that I asked a sequence of questions. Okay. So I guess now we're in the actual uh, heating of summer. So it's been getting hot lately. So hang in there, guys. Let me also mark down again. This is seventh lesson for July 13th, 2020. All right, let me get the eraser. And repeating, number one, how many parts is Asian history divided into? At least according to this book, right? Okay, so I, my guess is 108. So that would be 54. Okay, next one, two. The point of transition was when? Again, don't supply me because it's not stated in the book the exact year. Give me a roundabout. Three, which Asian country experienced the European three stage history sequence? Was it Mongolia? Who knows? There we go. Now I head back to the reading. Okay, so we ended on the bottom there with middle. So let me head on to the next page. Okay, so it's, you see it's connected middle ages, right? Neither China nor Korea, however, fits this three-stage European formula nearly as well. Your explanation. While there have indeed been many commonalities in global human history, especially in the Eurasian old world, where some degree of exchange was always continuous or always ongoing. 
it is probably a mistake to assume that a universal model can be constructed based exclusively on the details of any one particular case. Each local society is to some degree unique. That makes sense. And it may be presumptuous, which presumptuous means you're kind of thinking with ego instead of reason. You think it should be this way. So uh, it may be presumptuous to think that anyone represents a universal norm. So again, you know, the development of Indonesia is different than Japan, which is different than Korea and on down the road. Still, perhaps because of that continuous, if often slow and limited, ongoing process of cross-cultural interaction, there do appear to have been some overarching common trajectories, all oh, hard words again, in the history of the Eurasian world. So common trajectories is the a, a same path, right? Some did have the same path. Beginning in the 16th century, in particular, there are a few tantalizing similarities. It's interesting the writer here uses the word tantalizing. Tantalizing means something that looks really good or delicious. Usually this is used in food writing. Oh, the... Peking duck looks tantalizing. Mm, can't wait to get it, but uh, they're using it here for history. Uh, so tantalizing similarities between, yes, Western Europe, <coughs> excuse me, and both China and Japan that make an argument that they were all part of some more general Eurasian, the European Asian, early modern age seem at least plausible, uh, plausible means uh, believable. This writer here wants to use a lot of big words, wants to impress us. These parallels or similarities include points of both apparent convergence and convergence is when things come together and actual content. In China, the signs of such early modernity include the appearance of a commercialized consumer culture in the late Ming and the forging of a vast new gunpowder empire under the subsequent or following Qing dynasty. Okay, so modernity is just the word for modern and they have a commercialized consumer culture, which so does the United States. What's beating it up right now is the COVID that we can go out and shop a lot of places or even eat at restaurants. So. But they had a consumer culture at that time. No credit cards though. Uh, the conventional verdict or ruling judgment on the early Ming dynasty is that it was hopelessly isolationistic, which means uh, it did not seek to interact with foreigners. Uh, a lot of these countries had certain times when they were like this. Japan did, uh, Korea did, and they were called the hermit kingdom. And a hermit is a person that, like a monk, that goes up and lives inside of a cave in a mountain because he wants to be away from people. But eventually, they all at different times allowed the foreign investment. Under the first Ming emperor, a special document was required to travel more than 30 miles from home. Wow. So if I want to go to San Pedro, I have to ask the local um, sheriff if I can do that. And travel abroad without official permission was punishable by death. Now, that sounds like North Korea now. Right? People just can't leave unless the government says it's okay. 
Confucian moralists coming from the Confucius philosophy, moreover, were inclined or felt to decry or go against the growing commercialization of the dynasty, meaning the Ming dynasty, as a decline from the ideal order established by the dynastic founder, whether the government and Confucian moralists approved or not. However, private commerce still blossomed in the late Ming. So uh, these monks wanted to go back to an idealistic philosophical uh, order and didn't care if the government or moralists said no. We should have private commerce and maybe have some foreigners uh, come and uh, do some trade. They believe this might not be the good path or the correct path for China. Precisely because the government neither understood nor approved, much of this commerce took place outside the sphere or area of government surveillance. So that means government was not watching them. Ming commercialization therefore could be described as laissez-faire, that's a French term that we took into English, in approach partly by accident or fault, default. So kind of like, we don't know how it happened, but it kind of happened by accident. In some cases, however, the Ming's government attitude may have been deliberately laissez-faire. One late Ming official writing in the 1580s boasted, boasted means brag, for example, of how a reduction in commercial tax rates in the city of Nanjing not only resulted in increased trade, but also caused a net increase in tax receipts. So that's kind of like you're not saying, oh, they shouldn't have done that or that was illegal. You say, well, somehow it happened. And look, there is a benefit from this. So that's that's nice. So no one's really addressing, wow, that shouldn't actually be taking place. Uh, given China's huge size, most of China's trade has always been domestic or within the country. The Ming government inadvertently or accidentally helped facilitate or make easy internal trade by reopening and maintaining the Grand Canal, not the Grand Canyon here at the Grand Canal. Some 12,000 government barges, that's another term for a certain kind of ship, plied the canal or they were in the canal to bring tax grain from the south to the capital at Beijing in the north. And the private vessels, ship, smaller ship, that also took advantage of this man-made waterway, as well as the other, many other rivers and canals of South China were beyond count. So there's so many people involved in this kind of commerce that you could not keep track of them or record. Increasing economic specialization further stimulated or gave growth to interregional domestic trade. So that would be like interregional, you could have like a Guangzhou starts having trade with the Fukin area instead of just the south to Beijing, the capital. For example, concentration on the cultivation of cotton for textile production in the lower Yangtze River area created a local demand for imported food grain that was satisfied by shipments of rice from farther up river. 
By the 1730s, such shipments had reached a volume in excess of a billion pounds a year. That's a lot of rice. The invention, by at least mean times, of that invaluable tool of trade, the abacus, is another indication of growing commercialization. Okay. The mobility made possible by ease of transportation. Uh, just checking here, does anybody know what an abacus is? That I guess could be considered the very first the calculator. Uh, that's where you have a, like a wood frame, size of a box, and then you have some, how would you say, they're, they're skinnier than dowels, but uh, some, which I'll be really, really easy. So you have a number of sticks inside, and then you have uh, small round discs on them. And then you start with them all on the left, and then people start moving the disc. And they start adding, you owe this much money. And that was like the first uh, calculator, right? At least for uh, pricing. So, yeah, the abacus. Okay. So it looks like right, we're at the bottom of the second page. Let me proceed on to the whiteboard, yes. Pencil time. This should be question four. Question four. In China, signs of early modernity include what? That's going to be a short answer. Okay. Don't worry about that. Okay. I can move on to five. Okay, question five. For a long time, many, many years, most of China's trade was of what kind? What style? Okay, so my last question six for this page. Again, I'm being kind, long questions, short answers. I mean to put which there. Oops, I did mean to put what, I'm stepping ahead here. Big words here. OK. 
Okay. Let me read this to you. Which invention by the Chinese was an indication of growing commercialization? Something they invented could be used uh, for commercialization. So I will give you some minutes to uh, write those down. And let me make my markings that uh, we've read. 161, and ask the concurrent questions for five and six, for 161. Okay, I will go to the eraser. All right, here's four. In China, signs of early modernity included what? Could that be the very first Panda Express's opening? Is that the answer to four? Please don't get angry, one or Gao. Five, for a long time, most of China's trade was of what kind? Okay. What kind of trade? I don't, soy sauce? I don't know. Six, which invention by the Chinese was an indication of growing commercialization. I would say it's the walk. That's what it was, the walk. Okay, we got to say goodbye to six. We got to go back to the great lecture material. Okay, so we ended on the bottom of the page with transportation. So we got to move on. Now we're at the top of the next page, which would be 162. Okay, also encourage increasingly large scale recreational tourism. So, large scale means a lot of tourism, recreational. Um, you know, everybody's coming for different things. By the late Ming Dynasty, it had become common to complain in China that crowds of tourists and souvenir vendors were spoiling the tourist attractions, right? I don't know exactly to what extent that's true, but uh, a lot of ancient tourist sites anywhere in the world, uh, for example, they, they have the natural erosion from the weather, but if people constantly touch things, or like the Shalvin Temple there, uh, Hunan. People walk and walk and walk, and they change the actual stone flooring. So they were already complaining at this time, you know, 500 years ago. Uh, <clears throat> at sea off the Ming coast, in any single day, there might be as many as 1,200 ships. Wow, it's a lot of ships. Although much coastal shipping was for domestic purposes, there's domestic again, the volume of foreign trade was also substantial. So the foreign trade was growing. Again, they had said that, oh, the Ming Dynasty was mostly isolationist, not true. Since the Ming government viewed foreign trade with suspicion, not sure, is this a good policy? However, a large portion of this traffic operated outside the law. Uh oh, again, what they don't see doesn't hurt them, including both smuggling and 
piracy. Okay, so piracy has to do with uh, pirates. And smuggling is when you take something out of the country that you shouldn't or bring something into the country that is not allowed. So what I'm told is, uh, for example, Saudi Arabia, if you bring in a bottle of alcohol that is considered smuggling. And I guess in North Korea, if you bring in a Christian Bible and they find out that it's also smuggling. The contradiction between growing trade and government restriction of it reached its climax or high point in a period of so-called Japanese pirate raiding. So pirates attack off the coast. In Japanese wako, in Chinese woku, along the Ming coast, especially in the 1540s to 1550s. Uh, there was another word here. I want to make sure you get that too. Contradiction. So uh, contradiction is a lot of times when you say one thing and do the other. So kind of the government was allowing it, but they don't want to be known that they allow it. So they say, hey, it's happening in an area that we don't govern, so it's not our fault. So it's a contradiction. So again, on a basic level, if I tell you the best thing you could do it's never to smoke cigarettes. That's fine, but then you find out I smoke two packs a day, so that's a contradiction. Although actual Japanese people were certainly among these pirates, these sea pirates, many of the seaborne marauders, marauders just means like attackers, were really Chinese or Korean. Oh dear, so even Chinese people attacking uh, their own consumers who try to get money, right? Officially authorized trade, this one's important, between the Ming Dynasty and Japan was initiated or started by the shogun head of all the samurai, Yoshimitsu, in 1401. But this authorized trade was very limited in scale or size. And merchants who did not have the necessary official seals were probably always much more numerous, so many more in number. They developed a flourishing, flourishing means very successful, contraband. So now we're going back to uh, smuggling. So illegal goods are contraband. And if you didn't know, I've been on a small scale to this day, uh, chewing gum is considered contraband in Singapore. If they catch you with chewing gum in your suitcase, they will throw it away because it's all part of the Cleanliness Act in Singapore. They don't want the streets covered in chewing gum. So uh, with the Ming, imported luxury goods from Japan, which remember a luxury is not a necessity, but something you wanna have because you have money, it's beautiful. Um, so the impro imported luxury goods from Japan, especially lacquer ware, that is wood with a beautiful kind of shiny Varnish, they were famous for this at the time, and metalwork became notably fashionable items of late Ming consumption. So again, they're not talking about eating the lacquerware table or the metalwork, but buying it, and that is a form of consumption. That's where we get the term consumer. In addition to the Japanese imports, there were also other, even more exotic items such as edible sea slug or sea snail. One of the ugliest things I have ever seen, me personally, but 
I know Korean people, Japanese people, and Chinese people think that they are just so delicious. And they were uh, brought in from Eastern Indonesia, where Caroline's at. Caroline used to own a edible sea slug farm, I think, in Indonesia, where she married her third husband. And Australia, and even, if you're from New York, Toiki, if you're from the West Coast, like California, Turkey's from America. So China was fascinated with these turkeys. Interesting stuff, huh? Okay. Small bits of knowledge. Okay. The turkey has always remained a somewhat exotic creature in China. But another product native to the Americas, tobacco, was beginning to become generally popular in China by as early as the 17th century. So now they had a taste for tobacco. For the first 142 years of the Ming Dynasty, the only legally acknowledged or allowed foreign trade had been that which was conducted or done business with under the rubric of formal diplomatic tribute missions. Uh, so tribute is when you come in and give money to the local uh, king or shogun, right? Though these were sometimes merely fictitious pretexts for trade, so that means they just made up these things so that they would do trade. So if they were asked, well, we're giving tribute, but actually secretly doing trade with maybe tobacco or turkeys. And there was much extra legal activity. So again, they don't want things to be legal. Keep them, as we say here, under the table. But in 1509, Guangzhou in English, Canton, where we get the word Cantonese, was legally, legally open to private merchants from tributary countries. And in 1567, anybody remember 1567? It was a good year, I was around. A port in Fujian province was open to private Chinese traders. By that date, there was also already a permanent Portuguese presence on the Southeast coast of China. Conditions were significantly changing and China was being swept up into the now. So China was being taken out of the age old traditional routine and brought into the modern for the first time. Truly global trade routes that had been opened by the great early modern European age of exploration. The first Portuguese landfall in South China was probably made in 1513. I will not ask you to remember that for the midterm. Although the earliest Portuguese apparently came as passengers aboard Asian vessels, again, ships, and the first actual European ship may not have arrived until 1517. Uh, because of mutual misunderstandings, Portuguese relations with Ming China got off to a poor start. But by 1557, the Portuguese had a permanent base on Chinese soil or land at Macau, a small peninsula near the mouth of the river leading up to Guangzhou, across from what later would become the British colony of Hong Kong. So it's a sea map, but we don't have to remember maps here. Macau would remain under Portuguese jurisdiction uh, until the end of the 20th century. I saw the turnover from England to China, 1997 of Hong Kong. 
I think Macau was done in 2001 from Portuguese back to China because they, uh, England had signed a hundred year lease. So after a hundred years, they had to give it back. It had expired. By the 1560s, official Ming restrictions on overseas trade were beginning to relax. So they're starting to soften up their restrictions like, it's okay, we can let this happen. And the Portuguese were soon joined by the Spanish who had established a base at Manila in the Philippines in 1571. So they relaxed the restrictions and other Europeans wanted to hurry and make trade with China. So this brings us to the bottom of what would be 162. Well, I think it's question time. Okay, a little mistake you pull there. Let's see. All right, so I'll go back and fix that in a second. Let me get on to the questions. Text. Okay, so this would be question seven. Again, I've got these long questions. Why, why do I have to suffer all this writing and you guys just write the name of a country or something? Mm. Must be trying to be kind. Okay, here you go. Who officially authorized trade between the Ming Dynasty and Japan in 1401? That's a little before my time. I was born until the 1500s. So, who must have been a high level person somewhere? Genghis Khan, maybe? Who's the one who authorized the trade between these two countries? Okay. Okay, here's question eight. Oops, don't want equals. All right. Okay, question eight. Uh, which exotic thing was imported to China from America? Okay, if I was a student in this class, I would guess it was the hamburger. That's what I'm thinking. It was maybe a Big Mac or a double double with onion. Okay, that's my guess, but I might not be the best student. Okay. And then the last question for this uh, page, which again for Wani or Ishwan would be 162. Again, a super long question, and all I'm asking you is to name the country. It's not fair.
Okay, so the last one for this page. Question nine. Which European country established the first permanent, not one for a couple of days and disappeared, but the first permanent European presence in China? So would we guess Mexico? Now, if I have a smart student, the smart student's gonna say, uh, teacher, Mexico's not in Europe. You're right. So let me change my guess. Uh, maybe Russia. Okay, so let me give you a minute or two to write these down. Let me do my markings. Mark off that we finished this page. And I'll ask you this series of questions. And we're moving right along here. Nice steady pace, which is good. Okay, I guess it's the eraser time. So luckily, uh, Inky's not hiding the eraser. She liked to do that last quarter. So she used to throw it out the window, I think. Okay. Seven, repeating. Who officially authorized trade between the Ming Dynasty and Japan in 1401? Again, my guess is Temujin or uh, AKA Genghis Khan. All right, seven's gone. Eight. Which exotic thing was imported to China from America? I'm going to stay with the either the McDonald's Big Mac or the In-N-Out Double Double with onion. And nine, which European country established the first permanent European presence in China? I'm going to say it was Russia because Russia's the next door neighbor. So that's my guess. But please don't copy me. Unless your name is Pamela, Titan, Flores. Okay, now let me go back. I did a little boo boo here, so let me find where I'm at. Okay, this is where I was. As we can see here, we ended with the bottom of Manila in the Philippines. 1571, so we have to go to the next one. Okay, we're good as gold now, which will be on what is considered uh, 163, okay. All right, in the 16th century, most Portuguese profits from their Asian trade came from handling, shipping between destinations within Asia rather than from trade between Asia and Europe. So they developed a nice little inner market there. I guess the long shipping from Europe to China, you can only make so much money, but they could make a lot more money um, going on the inner trade. I guess kind of like a <clears throat> Hawaii, there's a lot of people that do a lot more, you know, you pay them one big price to fly from LA to Honolulu, but other people, they, oh, I go, to, I go from Hawaii to Honolulu to Maui, and then from Maui, I took a flight to the big island, which I've done before, and then I went to Kauai, and you know, so there's a lot of more money to be on a lot more frequent trips in that way. And that's what was going on here for the Portuguese. And why were they able to do this? It says here, with their seafaring and navigation, which is dealing with maps, skills and heavy seaborne firepower. So they had a lot of strong ships. The Europeans had carved an important niche for themselves on ancient Asian maritime trade routes. So carved just means make. Niche is a kind of more recent word within the last 20 years. 
and people talk about niche markets. So what these things is you make kind of like your own unique little market um, that can be uh, very successful, right? And that's what they did here. They had a certain amount of skills uh, to do that, right? So if I would say I wanted to sell some kind of Korean merchandise, uh, in K-Town, I'd probably do pretty good. But if I wanted to sell it in a city that had very few Koreans, I probably could not develop a niche market there, right? Okay. So Asian maritime trade routes, which maritime means sea, alongside Southeast Asians, which again includes Caroline from Indonesia. Uh, Indians, so. Indians from India, Arabs, and Chinese. But at this point, the Europeans were still far from dominant, at least as far as volume was concerned. So the, more, the larger volume was with China. When Portuguese firearms were first, those meaning guns, rifles, were first introduced to Japan in 1543, <clears throat> For example, it was by three Portuguese merchants who just happened to be aboard a Chinese ship that was blown off course, probably by a storm, to a Japanese island, Tanekashima. Anybody know where that's at? Is that next to Little Tokyo? It is not even certain if the guns they introduced were of European or Middle Eastern manufacture. The pioneering Christian missionary to Japan, St. Francis Xavier, which they have a school named after him in Hong Kong, 1506 to 1552, also arrived in Japan aboard a Chinese rather than a European ship. Little known information there. Chinese merchants who had fanned out, or mean fanned out means to spread out like a fan <laughs> spreads out. So had fanned out across Southeast Asia in substantial, many, many numbers, beginning especially after about 1500, still dominated much of the retail trade throughout. The region again china was still dominating even though portugal was doing quite well in spanish manila for example between 1571 and 1600 there were an annual average of 7,000 chinese visitors wow in comparison to a resident ruling who was in charge spanish and mexican population a fewer than 1,000. Hmm. Interesting. Andre Gunder Frank has recently argued that Europe, in its early modern age of exploration, did not really pull the rest of the world into a European centered economic system, at least not initially, which means at first. Instead, Europe belatedly joined an already existing world economy in which, if any location could truly be called, move up to this one, central prior to 1800, it was China, which I guess is not mentioned enough in Western history. Uh, but my Chinese students will know about this. They're all history majors. Early modern Europeans, moreover, still had no product that could sell consistently. Consistently, that's the key, not once in a while in China. 
except for money itself. Money is always good, right? But in the matter of cash, the Europeans were fortunate or lucky. Between 1492 and 1800, some 85% of the world's total silver supply and 70% of its gold came from the new European colonies in the Americas, mostly South America, Mexico, Central America. In Ming China, raw silver literally was money and early modern Europeans used a substantial portion of their new world silver to pay for imported Chinese luxury products such as porcelain, silk, lacquer where we talked about prior, and later tea, yes. Western people love Chinese tea. The Dutch became the most dynamic European power in Pacific waters in the 17th century. And although the focus of their attention came to be directed at what is now, now called Indonesia, used to be called the Salim, the Dutch also attempted to trade with China. In the first half of the 17th century, the Dutch imported some 3 million pieces of Chinese porcelain, which is often called China or Chinaware, into Europe and established a successful outpost on the island of Boba, later to be called the Taiwan. Uh, if you're not some sort of what is porcelain? Um, if you ever have to have a crown or a new tooth put into your mouth, the hard material that looks white color that is made from porcelain. That's what made the dishes or the chinaware. Again, love that island of Bulba. That's the original name of Taiwan. On Taiwan, the Dutch erected or built their second largest fortress in Asia. And there they purchased silk from Chinese merchants uh, to exchange for silver in Japan. So you see how it's developing this uh, large, large world economy. This Dutch base, on Taiwan survived for four decades, 1624 through 1662, and was ironically enough, responsible for encouraging the ancestors of the people we now call Taiwanese, uh, as distinct from the Aborigines who were there already, to begin settling the island. The Dutch were forcibly driven off Taiwan, or as we say now, kicked out of Taiwan in 1662. However, by a colorful Chinese freebooter named Yi Xuan, I'm sorry, uh, Zheng Chenggong, known in Europe as Kozinga, 1624, 1662, might be related to Wani. Uh, the son of a Chinese Christian and a Japanese mother, wow, who became the first Chinese ruler of Taiwan. At about 1690, the Dutch generally stopped even trying to. So that brings us to the bottom of this page. So you know where I gotta go, can you guess? Could it be the white barn? Or maybe I just have to go to the restroom. What is it? Let's find out. Guess it's not the restroom.
the white bar. All right, so this means I will be on question. Let me check here to make sure. Question 10. Okay. Looks like I got that pencil. Thank you, Tal, for giving me the pencil. You took it away from Tamuchan. Okay, so 10. Okay, question 12. I'm running words together. I shouldn't be doing that. Okay, so my first question is, what did the Portuguese introduce to Japan in 1543? So you see, I made this question where I supplied the date. I didn't ask you, in what year did the Bura Bura, right? I gave you the year, because I don't want you to remember a lot of dates. Okay. So what did they introduce? Uh, could it be Portuguese sausage? Is that what they introduced? I don't know, sausage. I'd have to ask my Chinese students, is sausage popular in China? I don't know. Okay, 11. Okay, 11, uh, what was literally, meaning literally used as money in Ming China for trade? So we're talking Ming China, would I guess uh, maybe noodles? Yeah, people bought things with noodles because noodles are important. Chinese culture. You ever heard of the 100 years noodle? You can only eat that after you're 101. Okay, you know that I'm probably not telling the truth. Okay, so my last question for this page. 12. No, that's the American culture. We love 12. We love dozens of eggs and things like that. Okay, 12, uh, where did the Dutch establish a successful outpost in Asia? Well, we sure talk about China a lot, so maybe it wasn't China, or maybe it snuck by and it was in uh, Japan, like maybe Nagasaki, who knows? You're supposed to pay attention to the material not ask questions, okay? So I'll uh, give you a few minutes to write those down. I'll do my responsibility. Mark that page. So Yishuan, that would have been 163. We only have uh, 25 more pages to go, so be strong, okay? And uh, let me mark off the accord of questions. And like I said, we're going on through.
Okay, is that enough time for me to go to the eraser or should I go out and change the tires on my car and then come back? What do you think, Pervi? Should I do that? No? Okay. All right, that means it's uh, I'll ask Tall. Tall, is it eraser time? Yes. Okay. It's eraser time. Thank you, Tall. I only listen to Tall. All right, 10 repeating. What did the Portuguese introduce in Japan? I'm going to stay with my first answer. Sausage. All right, that's what it was. Portuguese sausage. Quite tasty. 11. What was literally money in Ming China for trade? I'm still going to stay with noodles. Noodles are the most important thing. I'm just not sure if they use them as money as uncooked noodles or they had to be cooked. And then 12, where did the Dutch establish a successful outpost in China? I think I'm gonna stay with my Japan, okay? All right then, that's done. Stop the share, go back to the material. Okay. Maybe I'll try to enhance. Wow, look at that. Is that too much? For all the young people, you might say, oh, it's blinding me. For me, it looks pretty good. Okay. All right, so I've already advanced myself to the next page too. So I've uh, finished with the 163. I'm at the top of 164. Okay, so uh, trade directly with China. So they stopped even trying to direct uh, trade directly with China. They found it easier to allow Chinese and Portuguese merchants to come to the Dutch base on Java, which I think is Caroline's first husband's hometown in Indonesia to conduct trade themselves. Java, wow. Does that mean they make coffee? Uh, Europeans were therefore among the participants in China's overseas trade by the 17th century, but they were hardly a dominant presence. Again, China keeping them on a minimal scale. Even so, Europe had already begun to make an impact on China. The telescope, for example, which we use to look at the stars, right? Uh, was introduced to China by 1618. I think I was in middle school at that time. Within 30 years of its European invention, around 1590, so that's when it was invented in Europe, so it came later. A European style world map with captions written in Chinese was prepared by the Italian Catholic missionary Matteo Ricci, 1552 to 1610, in 1584. This was quickly copied and printed by the Chinese. A copy of a revised version of this map was eventually even hung in the large panels on the wall of the emperor's palace in Beijing. Wow. In addition to his map making contributions, Ricci also worked with the Chinese scholar Zhu Guangqi, 1562 to 1663, to produce the first good Chinese translation of Euclid in 1607. Euclid is a book. This same Chinese scholar, Tzu Guangqi, or says that Tzu Guangxi, I don't know, later rose to the highest office in the Ming government and became a baptized Christian, taking the Christian name Paul. I think that's an easier name to say. In the Xiu Guangxi. Okay. Matteo Ricci was a Jesuit. The Jesuits were a Roman Catholic counter Reformation order 
that produced uh, some of the best educated minds in 17th century Europe. Jesuits were uh, a Roman Catholic counter reformation order that produced some of the best educated minds in 17th century Europe. Jesuits were expected to undergo a nine year course of study. Hey, Pertivy, Demogen, can you imagine taking my class for nine years in a row? You'd go crazy, right? Uh, that included mathematics and astronomy, classical philosophy, art, and the humanities, as well as Christian theology or study of Christian religion. The first Jesuit missionary came to China from Japan. You be careful, I'm giving you guys hints. As it happens in 1552, when the Spanish Basque missionary, St. Francis Xavier arrived on an island off the Southeast coast. He died later the same year without ever making it to the mainland. Okay, let me make sure of something here. Yeah, it looks a little odd, but, uh, or wait a minute, let me see. Oh yeah, styles, okay. So we're still here on 64. Um, but other Jesuits followed. In 1601, Matteo Ricci became the first European Christian missionary since Mongol times to be allowed to reside in Beijing. Ricci may have also been the first European ever to learn to speak the Chinese language proficiently. With his profound erudition or ability to speak, scientific knowledge and accommodating approach, Matteo Ricci made a favorable impression on many Chinese. The Jesuit mission to China enjoyed a measure of real success. And by the end of the 17th century, there may have been 200,000 Christian Chinese converts. I wonder if any of my Chinese students in my class are Christian. That would be an interesting question. Okay, we're at the bottom of the page here. Arguably, however, the Jesuit reports from China had as much impact on Europe as their missionary activity had on the Chinese. Matteo Ricci drew on Chinese as well as European sources for his famous world map, and native Chinese and Japanese maps were of great interest to contemporary Europeans, so they also liked the Asian map. Um, curious early modern Europeans were also amazed to learn of China's reported antiquity or ancient times, which supposedly to Europeans was very perplexing or confusing. It extended back even before the widely accepted date of the biblical flood. So Chinese history went back farther than the time of Jesus. Europeans were also impressed by China's enormous size and apparent good government, remember, under the table. Ideas about China and Confucius had explicit influences on such important European Enlightenment figures as Leibniz, 1646 to 1716, Voltaire, 1694 to 1778, and the 18th century French school of pioneering economists who study money and financial trends and the market known as the physiocrats. There was, in addition, a long-standing vogue or style in Europe for Chinese-style art objects called Xinwari, which, among other things, had a significant impact on English gardening styles. Xinwari uh, is a French term. So that brings us to the bottom, <laughs> back to the stop and share. or some questions. And so, 
감사합니다. Okay. First question, 13. Okay, name two European inventions which had an impact on China. Okay, and uh, guess what? I'm only going to have two questions here. Go on. The last one on this page, I'm only doing two. Which Chinese philosophy influenced the European Enlightenment? I'm going to go with uh, Falun Dafa. That's what it is. So let me give you a few minutes to write those down. And let me mark down that we've just finished 164. We've done the questions for that page. All right, eraser time. Okay, name the two inventions. Oh, I don't know. That's a stumper for me. I don't know. Maybe the shoehorn and the tongue depressor. 14, which Chinese philosophy? Uh, Falun Gong, that's what it is. All right, back to what might be our last page of uh, reading. Let's see, we would be on 165. All right, oh, I actually have to move up, sorry. That was the last one we ended with gardening styles. Okay, so yeah, here we have it. In China, the 17th century was a time of remarkable tolerance individualism and open-minded intellectual inquiry inquiry is a question li yu 1611 to 1680 for example has been called china's first professional writer who intentionally made writing a profit making business venture wow li was best known as a writer of fiction short stories and plays but he was also an authority on gardening and interior design, a theater manager, critic, publisher with his own publishing firm, and the inventor of a heated chair for use in winter. Hmm, at that time, in his writing, he expressed some curiously modern sounding opinions, such as proto-feminist views about the equality of women, and in his fiction, he portrayed thieves, beggars, prostitutes, oh dear, and homosexuals sympathetically as characters to be judged by their behavior as human beings rather than as stereotypical moral categories automatically to be condemned. I guess at this time he would be called a progressive. Uh, the new age of commercial wealth, which began roughly, again, no exact date is known, in the mid-1500s, supported an affluent consumer lifestyle of conspicuous consumption. So conspicuous means you don't even care what you're buying. You just buy, buy, buy. Uh, that's a big reason why Michael Jackson went bankrupt. For a number of years, he was not popular and was not selling records, but yet he was not paying attention. He was still spending in the millions of dollars when, like when he was making a lot of money, went to his bankruptcy. As one Ming author observed in the 1570s, long skirts and wide collars 
broad belts and narrow pleats, they change without warning. It's what they call fashion. fashion. Word of the latest fashions was spread throughout China by books on connoisseurship, another French word, and etiquette, a French word, guides, which described even such things as the most tasteful way to display fruit on a plate and which circulated widely even to persons of relatively modest means in rural villages or country people. The male literacy rate in 17th century China has been estimated at between 40 to 50%. So half of the population was able to read and write. That's literacy. Anxiety to follow constantly changing fashions also produced a large market for cheap imitations and outright fakes, so like a fake Prada bag, right? <laughs> That's true. So uh, for fashion connoisseur shoppers who feared they might not be discriminating enough to judge product quality on their own, the maker's marks of well-regarded craftsmen and workshops began to function as an early form of reliable brands. So there you go. That's the beginning of Prada and Gucci. All of this seems strangely modern and reminiscent of Western developments because newly wealthy merchants in China wish to be seen as men of good taste. However, many of their favorite collector's items were drawn from the scholar's study including the paraphernalia or objects of writing itself, brushes ink, and ink stones necessary for grinding the solid cakes of ink. Such fashions reflected a uniquely Chinese socio-political order in which academic degree holders were the admired elite. Wealthy merchants emulated the lifestyle of scholars. Other fashionable collector's items included paintings, calligraphy, musical instruments, antique bronzes, and curios of every description. Perhaps the finest coordinated displays of late Ming taste and commercial wealth were the exquisite garden homes that began to be landscaped in extravagant numbers, most famously in Su Hu in late Ming China, in some ways surprisingly modern. Therefore, it was a modernity that took characteristically Chinese form. So they preferred the Chinese style over the European. European cultural influences were a minor undercurrent. And European cash, in the form of silver again, served a still predominantly Chinese economy. Despite the appearance of prosperity or success, Moreover, the Ming government itself was bankrupt and disintegrating or dissolving by mid-century. The Manchu conquest of China that began in 1644 would usher in a more conservative reaction and the open-minded tolerance that gave Li Yu's 17th century fiction such a surprisingly modern flavor would be bluntly or forcibly banned as immoral. Now I'm gonna proceed right at the bottom, but we got a little tidbit on the next page. How long can it be? Look at that, that's it, in the 18th century. These Manchu conquerors took China in other directions in 1644, okay? So there's a picture right there of a garden. All right, so I gotta to go to the last questions. Whiteboard, pencil, pencil, okay. Do I have 15 questions or 20? What do I got here? Okay, there's this question. You want this to be the last question of the day because we reached our time limit. So should I be kind?
what began in China in the 1500s? I'm gonna guess it was the disco period, you know, John Travolta and Saturday Night Fever. I think that's what began in China in the 1500s, because I was there, so I should know. Now, I have one more question, but we've reached our time limit. So I think I have to stop if I'm kind. So that being said, thanks for joining the second week, 7-13-2020. And uh, I shall talk to you next week about further westernization of Asia. Okay, so I'm gonna erase the last question, get the eraser, what began in China in the 1500s. I'm telling you it was disco time, disco tech. Okay, that's done. I'll go back here and stop the recording and I'll see you next week. Thank you.